Welcome everybody. I am Eric Wilkinson. I am a mental health clinician with uh, Work Plus Life Connections. And today I'm gonna to be talking about communicating mindfully. This is part of the Wellbeing Recharging Your Resilience series. And I found out I am the last presenter in this series, um, but I'm excited to be here. And uh, there's gonna be some interesting um, uh, programming coming forward, uh, probably some podcasts, so stay tuned for all that. Today, uh, what I want to talk about is um, just this kind of concept of really being um, purposeful in how you can apply mindfulness practices to communication. So we're going to explore the role of mindfulness in communication. We're going to identify key concepts in both uh, in terms of communication and also in terms of the mindfulness tradition. We're gonna talk about some practical techniques that you can use that will help you in your communication with others. Um, it can really help enhance relationships. And we're also gonna talk about some of the challenges and barriers of communicating mindfully in contemporary society. So I've been a, a mental health clinician for uh, about 14 years. I've been in behavioral health for about 17 years. And what we have here is the, the, what tends to bring people in to counseling is they're having some relationship problems with others. Um, often there's a, a conflict that is, is kind of centered around feeling unseen or not being heard by significant others, friends, family. Sometimes this experience of being really lonely or feeling disconnected, misunderstood. Uh, other times, folks will come into uh, counseling because they are experiencing some uncomfortable thoughts and emotions. So what we're really talking about there is a difficulty with kind of the relationship with self. And so in both in terms of how we communicate with others and how we communicate with, with ourselves, um, it has real impact in terms of the quality of our relationships. So let's just first start, and I want to tease something out. I, um, I took this from... Uh, kind of the uh, the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy framework, whereas where we uh, understand emotions as bundles of thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, and impulses to act. Now, the reason why this is important is a lot of times people will use feelings and emotions um, as synonyms, but I think this is also has some conceptual value because what we know is that thoughts and feelings, bodily sensations, they're intertwined. So sometimes uh, we can have a thought and there's often an emotional reaction to it or an emotional component to it, um, a feeling that goes along with it. Uh, we can also have feelings. We can be feeling kind of uh, sad or we can feel low energy and this impacts the way we think. Uh, we can have physical sensations if we're experiencing some, some pain. We know a lot of times if we're in pain, that's gonna impact the way we both experience feeling and emotional feeling and then also in the terms of the way we think. And so there is these, these things that emotions are this kind of bundle of these different experiences. And when I say it, it's dialectical, what I'm, what I'm talking about here is that feelings can impact thoughts, thoughts can impact feelings. So um, in terms of thinking about why uh, mindfulness approach to relationship is important, is that it can help us with these difficult emotions. And so if we think about uh, what I would call mindful meditation. It basically consists of noticing, experiencing, and observing. And so we can notice, when I talk about noticing, we're talking about where, where do you focus your attention? When I talk about experiencing, I'm talking about actually being present in your experience. So in other words, you're not on autopilot, um, you're not distracted, you're fully engaged with your experience, both in terms of your thoughts, your emotions, and your physical experience. And then there's this process of witnessing, of, of observing. And so while this, why this has value is that for folks who have difficulty with distressing emotions, uh, uh, disturbing thoughts, uncomfortable thoughts, uh, ruminating thoughts, people that have trouble with cravings or urges, when we practice uh, being present with difficult emotions, we are able to see that all these experiences are transitory and they're, in, and they're impermanent. So they don't last forever. And so when you engage mindfulness practices, you can see thoughts come and go, you can see feelings come and go. And same thing with physical sensations. If you ever have um, like an itch and you wanna scratch it, if you take a moment just to sit and be present with that itch, you'll notice that it, it will eventually subside and go away. 
The other thing uh, of value in terms of practicing sitting with and being present with difficult emotions is that it builds resilience. And this is because um, you get the practice of experiencing emotions, but not being overwhelmed by them. And a lot of times what brings people into counseling is they feel like they are not able to experience anxiety or fear or loss or grief. They feel overwhelmed. So the practice of being with uncomfortable emotions, uh, being with uncomfortable thoughts, it builds our resiliency. Um, in terms of mindfulness definitions, the most cited definition is the Kabat-Zinn definition. Uh, he defines mindfulness as the awareness that emerges from paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. Now there's a lot packed into that definition. Uh, what I wanna highlight is this idea of awareness, of being present with your experience. Uh, there's definitely a focus on the present moment in terms of both your thoughts, your emotions, your physical body, uh, engaging your senses so that you're present with your surroundings. And then there's this practice of observing, observing but without judgment, which is a lot easier said than done. Uh, another uh, mindfulness definition is from Ellen Langer. And the reason I like her uh, definition is twofold. One, uh, she's seen as the mother of, of mindfulness and, and some of her work actually um, coincides or, uh, with Kabat-Zinn's uh, uh, pioneering work. But what I like about her definition is this idea that mindfulness is a simple act of noticing new things. And so why, why I like this definition is that every moment that we experience is new. Um, we are, uh, you know, life is a series of continuous moments. No, n none of these moments are the same, but we often forget this kind of radical truth. We often assume I've been here before, I've experienced this before, I know what this is. And we kind of close ourselves off to the newness of life. So mindfulness is kind of opening ourselves back up to the realization and to the presence that um, everything, every moment is new and there are always opportunities to engage our experience. When I'm working with clients, one of the things I like to talk about is uh, present moment living. And so what I mean by that is kind of getting out of your head, getting out of uh, habitual ways of thinking, uh, ways of feeling and acting. So a lot of times um, in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, they talk about uh, going on autopilot. Now, if we think about when I, when I uh, drive to work in the morning, I don't want to have to every day I get up for work, figure out how to operate my car. I also don't necessarily want to try to figure out, you know, what is the route to work? Um, so autopilot is, an, uh, is kind of an evol evolutionary advancement that has real value because it makes us more efficient. But it also creates problems when we are on autopilot all the time, because what it does is it shuts us down from our, our present experiences, and it kind of gets us in a rut in terms of just um, thinking the same way, feeling the same way. This is particularly problematic when people uh, feel anxious or sad or depressed, or when their thinking patterns are such that they're highly critical of themselves or others. Uh, we do know that when people are self-referential, overwhelmingly the majority of our thoughts tend to be critical and distressing. And there's been some in interesting research where they look at the more people kind of uh, daydream or let their minds wander into the past, the present, or into self-referential subjects like, what am I doing with my life? You know, um, I need to eat healthier. Um, I wonder what my coworkers said when they meant this. When they, when, they, when they said that uh, they couldn't come to my party. You know, when we get into the self-referential kind of narrative, a lot of times we feel stress and the quality of our life goes down. Um, and the more we're actually able to be present with what's happening right now, so right in this very moment, I'm kind of in this awkward situation where I'm in a room with no people, but I'm talking to people and I'm looking at a camera and I'm looking at a laptop. This is my present moment experience. Uh, one of the things about present moment living is that you're honest with yourself and you're honest with others with what, what's happening right now. So if we think about mindful meditation, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the way to understand it is that you notice things. You, you bring your attention to um, something in your current experience and then you let yourself feel it. So for me, I just brought my awareness to the fact that I'm sitting in front of a camera. I brought myself uh, the awareness that I'm sitting in this room over at the Seton Center. And then I allow myself to experience this. And it's, so there's some anxiety there. There's a little bit of uh, curiosity about how this is being received. Um, 
And so what I can do is I can notice these experiences. I can notice maybe I have noticed that my mouth is kind of dry, so I'm going to get some drink, green tea here in a moment. I notice these physical experiences. I know I notice these emotional experiences. I notice the type of thoughts that I'm having, and I can observe them without saying whether they're good thoughts, bad thoughts, right or wrong. I don't have to react to them. I can just notice them, observe them, and be present with them. Okay, so the value in this is with, um, here's a long list of mindfulness qualities. When we practice present moment living, um, I mentioned earlier, there's uh, central to mindfulness is this idea of non-judging. Now, let me just be clear. This is the idea that we are open to experience without having to label it as good or bad or categorize it. Having said that, judgments arise. You know, so many of our thoughts are automatic. So when we notice a judgment arise, um, we don't have to do anything with it. Um, our thoughts are not the truth. I tell my clients that all the time. Uh, thoughts are stories we tell ourselves. Thoughts are interpretations. Your thoughts are not the truth. Your thoughts are not you. Um, same is true with emotions. Emotions are experiences. They're transitory. Uh, they're, not, they're not the truth, um, even if they feel powerful. And so this idea that a judgment may arise um, when we when it does, we just notice it and then we shift our attention back to the uh, to the next moment. It's on to the next moment. This uh, concept of non striving. This is um, this idea that you're accepting what is and that you're not you're not wishing that things were some other way. So for me, you know, if I was sitting here in front of this camera wishing I was in Hawaii right now doing a podcast from Hawaii, you know, and it wasn't cold and rainy and um, I got a little bit better sleep last night, I could wish for all of that and that creates suffering. So a mindfulness practice is to kind of be present with what is and, and, um, and, you know, and not um, wish for things to be otherwise. That gets into this idea of radical acceptance, this acceptance uh, with, uh, in terms of just our, you know, acceptance of the thoughts we have, acceptance with how we feel, acceptance with um, uh, how our body feels, how, our, uh, how we are emotionally. It's this acceptance that what is, is, and, you know, and, and just, you know, I'm, I'm basically not going to try and change it. I'm open to my experience as it is. I'm curious to, about my experience. Uh, patience is important because when you're practicing mindfulness, a lot of times we, we live in a fast paced world and we want to rush on to the next moment. Uh, we want to get, we want to solve problems quickly. We want people to get to the end of their stories. The idea of patience is that when you are communicating or when you're interacting, that you allow things to unfold in, in terms of their own time. So patience is, is a, a central part of mindfulness. Trust, what I'm getting at here is, is trust in yourself and your intuition, trust in your ability to uh, cope with difficult emotions or difficult feelings, trust in your ability to make decisions. Openness, this is this idea that you are, um, you're, you're curious about the world, um, you're present and you're, and you're just saying, you know, I'm here and I'm open to whatever comes forth, particularly in interpersonal relationships and in communications. Other concepts, observing and letting go. I mentioned this earlier, this is the idea that you can notice a, a, an experience, but you don't have to get swept up in your thoughts. You don't have to get swept up in your emotions. You can notice um, anxiety, you can notice some stiffness in your neck, and then you can, be, you can let it go and be open to the next moment. Gentleness is this idea that you befriend yourself and you befriend, befriend others in interactions. Uh, generosity, um, what we're getting at here is that you're not trying to force things to serve your own purposes, that you're not trying to manipulate people. Empathy is this idea that you're open to uh, feeling with others, to sharing their concerns, connecting. Gratitude is this practice of showing appreciation. I mean, I'm, I feel tremendous gratitude uh, for being in work life. I have, um, I'm one of four therapists. Um, I have an incredible director, supervisor, administrative staff. Uh, Terry does uh, elder care. Um, she does amazing work. And, but I wanted to like practice some gratitude right now. Even this very morning, uh, Anne, uh, who is one of the, Anne Bassoni is one of the, the longest tender uh, counselors within work life this morning gave me this really sweet, encouraging gift. Um, and it's, and, and, you know, I'm just, yeah, I have tremendous gratitude every day I come into work because one, I'm getting to 
uh, work with amazing professionals, amazing staff, just these really beautiful people. And, and, and I'm referencing both my clients and my coworkers when I say that. And then finally, this practice of loving kindness. This is where we wish benevolence, good things for ourselves, for others, and for the world. Okay, so in terms of different types of mindfulness practices, most people are probably familiar with uh, mindfulness of the breath. This falls in the focused attention meditation practice. And essentially, um, with a focused attention practice, you can focus on breath, you could focus on sounds, um, you can bring awareness or attention to your body. But the idea here is that when your mind starts to wander, you bring it back to an anchor. And, and you anchor it to something in the present moment. Um, open presence med meditation, this is where, and I really love uh, encourage clients to use this, this is where you practice just sitting and being open to whatever arises. Um, you don't have to focus on your breath. You're just open to what any thoughts that arise. You notice them. You observe them. Emotions, physical sensations, sounds. Um, you're engaged with both your senses and kind of with your internal experience. And you just, you just observe what happens. Again, this builds resiliency and in in, uh, strengthens your capacity to cope with difficult emotions. Body scans are where you intentionally bring your attention to different parts of your body. Um, this, and when I use this with clients, I usually, um, if you do mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, a lot of times body scans are done laying, uh, lying down. But what I will encourage folks to do is even just in your seat, just kind of sit up straight, um, put both feet down on the ground, and as soon as you do that, you feel grounded. And you can bring your attention to how your feet feel, how they feel in your shoes, place a contact uh, between your feet and the floor. You can then shift your uh, attention to your uh, ankles or your calves. Uh, maybe you can feel the sensation of your clothes against your calves or maybe there's some tightness. And essentially you work through different parts and regions of your body, just, just shifting your attention. And this again is really helpful in terms of uh, learning to, to be present with your body. Uh, when you do body scans as a regular practice, then you start to do it um, you know, throughout the day. I'll just check in to see, do I have any discomfort in my back? Uh, I often talk to my clients about, you know, I'm constantly just like stretching my shoulders or I might just go like this or, you know, basically I'm just scanning my body and being present. Um, and when I do that, I come out of my mind and come into the present moment. Uh, loving kindness meditation. This is an ancient meditation. Uh, there's a lot of research around how it enhances compassion and feelings of well-being. Mindful, mindful movement could be gentle stretching. It could actually be yoga. And then mindful walking is, again, this idea that you use your senses. And while you're walking, you're just really present in the physical sensations. Um, I'll speak just briefly to this because uh, people that know me know I'm a big proponent of mindful walking. Uh, what I like about it is when you, especially if you do it outside, um, you can really engage your senses, the way the air feels on your face, you know, the sounds you hear, um, the contact of your feet between, between, um, uh, with the ground. Uh, this process of coming into your physical body um, and coming out of your mind is very, very therapeutic. It's, uh, it calms your parasympathetic or activates your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and what I like about it is, is it just kind of lets yourself um, get out, disrupt your thoughts, um, step outside of kind of habits of thinking and habits of feeling. So um, central to mindfulness and then also in terms of uh, a skill set that um, is taught you know, when you're going to introduce the idea of communicating mindfully is this, um, this idea of beginner's mind. And so here are different components of beginner's mind, but the best way to think about beginner's mind is to, to imagine like to imagine you're seeing the world for the first time or whatever experience that you are currently having. Imagine that this is completely new. So if you sit down for a meeting within your office, you know, often we will kind of uh, our minds will go into autopilot. Um, we'll say, I know what I know what an office meeting is like. I know how this is going to go. Um, but if you're practicing beginner's mind, then then you're 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 approaching the situation like it's the first office meeting you've ever been to. And so one component is just acknowledging and accepting what is. And so, again, this is this, you know, you don't have to do anything with with your experience. You're just acknowledging it. You know, it could be I acknowledge that I'm feeling a little bit tired or 
I acknowledge that I'm feeling um, restless or I'm invigorated. Um, you accept whatever experiences come. Uh, this process of non-judgment, what we're talking about here again is impartial witnessing. So this is the idea that you have an observer's mind, uh, you're stepping outside of your direct experience. So you could imagine yourself like on a mountaintop looking down or um, uh, elevated above yourself and just witnessing the type of thoughts you're experiencing, the types of emotions you're experiencing, the physical sensations, uh, the stories you're telling yourself. And you can notice it and you don't have to rate it as good or bad. You don't have to say, I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be thinking that. I shouldn't be feeling that. You can just notice without judgment. And then when judgments inevitably do arise, like, I don't want to be in this meeting. Um, this meeting is boring. Um, why, is that, why does my coworker talk so much in these meetings? I have a feeling some of my coworkers might sometimes have that thought with me. Um, when, you, when, when you experience these judgments, again, you can just note the judgment and then open yourself on to the next moment. Non-attachment, this is where you don't get swept up in your thoughts. So uh, we, we have all kinds, again, thoughts are like stories. We have these really strong storylines. So if we're having um, some kind of ongoing conflict with uh, an intimate partner, a lot of times people will get swept up in the story, you know, so-and-so doesn't appreciate me. Um, you know, they don't value me. They're taking advantage of me. And when you attach to these kinds of stories or these types of thoughts, it filters every experience you have with that person. Uh, with the feelings, again, um, you can experience a feeling and, and, not, and recognize that this is transitory. And you can continue to, you can feel some anxiety within the, just the course of this, you know, 10 minutes I've been speaking. I've had all, all different kinds of uh, feelings come and go, some anxiety, some uh, feelings of content, some joy, some gratitude, you know, just being open to my different feelings in this present moment and not, not attaching to one feeling, even if it's really strong. Um, all this goes to this kind of broad, uh, bigger process of noticing things and letting them go, um, being, letting yourself experience it and then being open to the very next experience. Um, I'm a, I, I'm a, a basketball and a soccer fan, joy, and I enjoy playing both of those sports. And one of the things that sometimes gets said in basketball games is on to the next play. And so this idea that you can, you know, you can make a mistake in a basketball play, but if you stay stuck in that space, if you keep thinking about it, if you stay frustrated, then you're probably going to continue to make mistakes. So on to the next play, on to the next moment. And then finally, when you're using beginner's mind, you don't have expectations for how something is going to go. You're just open to it. So when you go into an office meeting or you go out to dinner um, with somebody who in the past, maybe you've had some conflict, you don't predict, you know, this is going to be a, a boring dinner or this is going to be a stressful dinner. Uh, with an office meeting, you don't predict, you know, this is a waste of my time. You never learn anything new. Instead, what you do is you, you approach these situations and these experiences uh, uh, without expectation. Okay, so when we cultivate beginner's mind, what we can do is we can break the chain of habitual thinking and acting. So when we're in autopilot uh, mode of being, you know, we have these ruminating or these thoughts that are repetitive. I mean, it's estimated that probably 80% or more of our thoughts are repetitive from day to day. And so when we cultivate beginner's mind, it's like we wake up and we break the chain of this habitual thinking. Um, same thing with our actions. You know, we, we tend to find ourselves reenacting or, or interacting with folks the same way day to day. Uh, cultivating behavior's mind, uh, beginner's mind, I'm sorry, you will uh, you'll surprise yourself. You'll find new ways of being. Um, you know, sometimes we'll say, oh, I can't, I've heard people say, I can't do this, I'm not a creative person, right? That's a, a habitual thinking pattern and it limits their behavior. But if you can notice that thought and then let it go, you could find yourself um, finding some new creative outlet or some kind of experience. So when we're in autopilot, we're really, we're really just kind of relying on scripts, we're relying on patterns of thought, we're relying on habitual behaviors. Um, when we cultivate beginner's mind, we're able to have more conscious choice in what we want to do. We don't have to just reenact or do the same thing we've done before. Okay, with communication skills, here are some core communication skills. Um, the idea that when we're, when we're having a conversation, we wanna be truthful and we want it to be balanced, meaning that we, don't, we talk and listen. 
Um, listening skills, I think, are central to communication. And I think that this is one of the areas where people struggle the most. Um, being able to really empathize when you're talking with somebody, uh, be interested in their concerns, connecting with their emotion, asking them questions. Um, things that really get in the way of listening is when you give people advice or you interrupt them or you interrogate them. Uh, being aware of your nonverbal communication matters. So if you're looking down when you're talking to somebody, they often will experience that as dismissive or that you're not really interested in what they're saying. Um, you know, if you, if you have a, some tension in your body or stress in your face, on a nonverbal level, um, human beings recognize that and that, you know, it's going to be a barrier to um, connecting with that person. Uh, filtering mechanisms, we've talked a little bit about this. This is this idea that our self-talk, um, our self-fulfilling pro uh, prophecies, um, our e what I mean by ego is I'm talking about, you know, this idea that we're not open to experiences because we don't think that's who we are. I'm not the type of person who paints, so I'm not open to painting. Or um, I, I, somebody might have this concept of themselves that I'm a really shy person, so when they're in a meeting and they have a great idea, they don't share it. Um, and then finally, assertive behavior is where we use our I statements. So we acknowledge our feelings, we acknowledge um, our values, um, but we use it in terms of uh, I statements. So I'm feeling kind of frustrated right now. Uh, please be patient with me while I try to figure this out as an example of an I statement. Okay, so this idea of my, mindful communication, this is from Dan Huston's work. And he's, he encourages you to apply the beginner's mind to your communications with others. So you see the world as a clean slate. Um, you're observing both verbal and nonverbal communications in the moment. And you're observing these uh, communications from others as well as yourself. This includes self-talk. Um, you're aware of the type of emotions you're experiencing and the body sensations, your body language. And, and when you introduce mindfulness, what happens is that you can, can observe and notice and even if you're feeling angry or frustrated, you don't have to react in kind of a habitual or a unconscious manner where you raise your voice or you walk away um, or you criticize somebody. Instead, you could notice that anger, uh, be aware of it. And then when you bring into that mindfulness there, then you can make a conscious choice about what you want to communicate next and how you want to respond. So it's a difference uh, between responding and reacting. When we're unconscious and we're on autopilot, we just uh, we usually just react to whatever kind of thoughts or emotions pass through us. But when we are mindful, it gives an opportunity to, to create some space and to actually decide how we want to respond. Okay, and that's what I just described right here. Mindfulness creates the space where you can respond instead of react. Uh, this is really important in terms of communication, this idea of holding the space where you can listen to somebody, you can empathize with them, you can be curious about their experience, and you don't have to give them advice, you don't have to tell them what to do. This idea of being present with somebody, especially when they're experiencing difficult thoughts or difficult emotions, it really, it really uh, helps bond and, and form connection. And we know that when somebody is stressed and they reach out and you just listen to them, that releases oxytocin in both the person who is reaching out for help as well as the person who listens. And so oxytocin is the bonding chemical, it's a stress hormone, and uh, it's a, a hormone that's released uh, to inoculate us during moments of stress to make us feel better. It's called the cuddle hormone. So there's, you know, oxytocin feels really good. And when you hold the space and you listen to somebody, um, it increases the oxytocin in both, both people. So our personal challenges, I'm just gonna quickly go through this because Jacob's indicated to me that um, I only have a couple of minutes left, but personal challenges are when we, can, when we become defensive. And so if we feel like our integrity is being questioned, then we want to go on the attack. Um, we wanna defend our integrity. If you can suspend that defensiveness, then you can be curious about maybe the criticism that somebody is providing you. Personas, what we're talking about here, this is where you feel the need to project a, a public image. It really takes you out of the moment. The communication ceases to be authentic. And then we've talked uh, several times about this idea that if you attach the thoughts and feelings, get swept up by your thoughts and feelings, which are not true. Um, uh, they're not reality. They're interpretations. They're momentary and transitory. 
But when you attach to these things, basically you, um, your capacity to learn and be present goes down. And then finally, the idea of scripts, this is just where we go into autopilot, say things like we always say things, act like we always act, behave like we always behave. In terms of uh, social technology, um, we know that the, path, the pace of life, and this is explored by Ben Agar, um, is increasing. You know, we, we have lots of demands placed upon us. We are, always feel overstimulated, overscheduled. Um, the pace of life, um, you know, in terms of what we're bombarded with stimuli and in terms of our obligations, it makes it really hard to be present in the moment. We feel like we're rushing from one thing to the next. And the research indicates that when we live this way, um, you know, it activates our amygdala, our, uh, we, that which is where our fight and flight response is based. And it really um, threatens the quality of our life. Um, there's also porous boundaries between personal work life. You know, if you think about with, uh, with uh, social technology, you know, your child can FaceTime with you while you're at work. So your, pers your personal life comes into work. The opposite is true. You have folks that are in their bedroom checking their email, their work email, which I would never do. Um, but this kind of like uh, this, uh, the, these, this blurring of boundaries makes it really hard for you to step outside of always um, being in kind of this problem solving mode that's required at work and not allowing yourself just to be with others and be present uh, in a mindful way. And then finally, the other thing about this is with the new technologies, there's constant intrusions with text messages, phone calls, Facebook stuff, memes, and these intrusions, they disrupt our flow. Um, we could be in the middle of writing something, thinking through something, and we get a text message, and, and all of a sudden it's like we're, you know, our flow is completely lost and we have to start all over again. Um, just in terms of some research that supports what I was just talking about, um, multitasking causes brain fatigue, it can, and, and on top of that, it's not efficient. Um, when you do a task um, while you're multitasking, it takes five times longer than if you just were to focus at one task at a time. Um, there's also the strong correlation between uh, social media use for adolescents and depression, anxiety, and psychological distress. And then finally, we know that smartphones and um, social media like Instagram, Snapchat, these uh, operate or impact our, the reward system of our brain and create addiction, um, similar to other types of drugs. And what that does is it not only does it pull us out of the, our present moment, but it also, when you create that kind of, um, uh, that pattern of needing, craving, um, then you're always looking for your next fix. And again, in that, in that way, it's, it's a, a very, uh, makes it a challenging way to be. Okay, um, finally, I'll just conclude with this. Um, when you prepare for mindful communication, you can do meditation practice. It could be formal meditation of breath, but it could also be walking, it could be stretching, it could just be awareness of your experience. When you check in with yourself and your emotions, you're much more able to actually not react in while you're communicating or interacting with others. You have this greater awareness of what's going on with you, and then you can make choices. It's important to nurture yourself before you um, intend to communicate with someone mindfully. Um, practicing beginner's mind is essential. Uh, letting go of agendas. In other words, if you go into a, a communication saying, this is how I want this to go, um, then you're going to try and force things. You're not going to be open to building connection or understanding. Personas is this performance where it pulls us out of the moment. Um, you want to really work at connecting with the other person's concerns and feelings and experiencing empathy, uh, showing open body language. And finally, um, this idea that you can focus your attention on a communication uh, that's taking place right here in the present moment and not trying to multitask. These are all things that help you to communicate mindfully. Um, here is a slide that documents some of the other work-life events we have coming up. Right now, there's a relationship check-in that's going on at the UK Family Center. Um, we also are going to, we have a lot of really cool groups for parents, for, uh, through elder care. Um, and then uh, Cindy Bowling is, uh, is starting a mindfulness and emotion group. And so I think the first one we're going to do is um, I'm going to co-lead this with her. And I also believe Jackie Hansen from um, Health and Wellness is going to be involved. We're going to do this on March 6th at the Arboretum. So I definitely wanted to plug that. But um, there's a lot of really great programming in terms of both mindfulness practices, 
self-care relationship building um, through the work life program. And, and again, there's, we speak to um, UK employees with all kinds of different needs and different interests. And I will now open it up to questions. Okay, uh, can I elaborate on my statement that emotions are not real? So an emotion, what I mean by that is that they're not the, our emotions are an experience, but they're not the entirety of reality. So often when we're feeling, let's say depressed, right? That is, that, that feeling um, is an experience, but it's not the totality of our experience. What it tends to do is it, it, it filters um, the way we think, the way we act, everything gets filtered through that emotion. Um, it's also not reality. Another way of thinking about this is our feelings, they're transitory. Even the worst feelings of grief or t terrible loss or fear, um, they're momentarily, they don't last forever. And so what I'm really talking about is that, uh, that feelings are fluid. And when we feel really strong feelings or when really strong feelings uh, come on, it's, it's like it makes it hard to notice the, uh, to the other thing, notice the other things present in our direct experience in our life. And, and it, it, it kind of like, it's like, a, like, like turning the volume up really loud and it drowns out all the other quieter uh, feelings that might be present. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what about the interactions when someone is venting and there's a lot of negativity? Um, so that's, you know, that's a great question. Um, if somebody is coming to you because they're distressed and you can, you can hold the space and be curious about what is going on with that person, um, this kind of gets at the difference between empathy and compassion. And so empathy is where we only feel with the other person. And so if the other person is venting and expressing a lot of stress and all we're doing with them is taking an uh, empathic approach then there is the risk that we can just um, uh, internalize their stress and, f and feel awful. But if you think about how, um, I like to use this metaphor, if you, saw, if you see a toddler fall down and, and start crying, um, in that moment, the, the parent does experience empathy for their child, but it shifts to compassion. And so compassion is this idea that you can feel the person's concerns, but you also have the impulse to alleviate their suffering. And so in a lot of ways, this, there's a slight difference in, in terms of the, the, the neural activity in your brain when you experience compassion versus empathy. But if you can cultivate compassion, this idea that you care about somebody and you, you uh, wish them well and you want to alleviate suffering, um, it, it enhances the, your ability to be in that situation and also to be helpful to the person in that situation. Um, I think, is that all of our questions? All right. Well, again, I wanted to um, thank everybody who joined in today. And um, this is my first time doing a webinar. Uh, and again, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I just want to conclude with saying, again, I'm one of four therapists in uh, Work Plus Life connections and every UK faculty and staff or dependents of UK faculty and staff or retirees are entitled to five free counseling sessions per year per employee and folks will use this for all different types of reasons and um, so if you're ever interested just check us out we uh, we love the UK community and we love working with everybody